All right, we're going to be in Ephesians chapter 4 this morning, and we'll be starting with verse 17. It is good to, to see you all, so thank you for being here today. We're going to be um, opening up this uh, message this morning. This is actually the conclusion of God is So Good series. We've been doing this here now for the last several weeks. This here is talking about a new life. So I don't know about any of you that's ever wanted a new life. Some of you might want to hit reset right now, or some of you might be just recently hit reset, you know, saying, well, what, I'm turning over a new leaf, you know, and those kind of things, or, you know, starting a brand new start. And, of course, it doesn't have to be January or a New Year's resolution for that to happen, but it's one of those things that life sometimes deals with hands uh, that just seem like we cannot win. Uh, you know, I learned early on, um, you, you know, I, I'd be, I guess, uh, uh, hiding the truth if I told you that I hadn't gambled before. I played poker before, and I learned early on that I'd be a broke man if I played cards a lot. I can tell you that right now. I also learned, too, early on that I wasn't much of a fisherman, as I've confessed here recently, and if I had to rely on catching just regular fish, I'd probably starve to death. Uh, so my point is I had to revert to something else. But but we're all, we all have things that we're good at and some things we're not, but that's what makes us strong together because you can take your strengths and my weaknesses or my strengths and your weaknesses and together uh, we can overcome anything together. Amen? And so when we look at a new life and we talk about this here, I praise God this morning that he has allowed us to be new creatures in Christ. That's what 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 teaches us, that we should be be new creatures in Christ. If the old things have passed away, behold, all things become new. And I know that in our nation, <clears throat> we are celebrating um, this fourth weekend uh, about the independence and the freedom that we have as a country. And we know that that obviously, when we think about the freedom that we have in God is tremendous, knowing that we have been forgiven. To be able to feel the gravity this morning of what we have been forgiven for. And to be able to know what we've been saved from or what we know we'll be, be saved for is tremendous. Uh, we're going to look at a couple of correlations here between the New Testament and the Old Testament this morning. And I want you to be able to see these this morning in the new light, to be able to realize this morning just how blessed we are, yes, but at the same time, what kind of great challenge the Lord has put before us to be able to, to look at things in a wonderful way. We have a new life. And I'm going to say something to you this morning. You would be selling yourself short this morning for there not to be a newness in your life. I don't care what age you are. I don't care where you've been or what you've done. I want you to understand this morning that we all have a newness about us. You know what I mean? You know my fetish about smelling a new car. There have been several of you through the years who got a new car, and you see me in the park a lot or tell me in here, meet me outside, and I didn't know what was going to happen when I got out there and come to find out you had a new car, and I was able to stick my head in your window and smell that newness. That was a hallelujah moment. I just, I just love that. Uh, I love the smell of new shoes, and I'll tell you right now, you better take advantage of that before you put them on your feet. Amen, somebody? And so my thing is, uh, it's just I, just I enjoy those things, and it's like some of those things that you cannot you cannot just reenact. You know, you can't just substitute. There's no substitute. I'm going to tell you, there's nothing knowing that there's a freshness in your life because of what God has done for you. Um, I mean, man, he can just take out and clean out those old basements and old cellars or those old attics or old garages or old buildings. And I'm telling you, you won't even smell a hint of old or mildew or mold or anything corrupt. And it would just be a freshness. And so I want you to be able to understand this morning that this message is applicable to us all. It doesn't matter where we are, whether we're saved, whether we're lost, whether we're mature in our faith, whether we're just learning. That, you know, that's no, no age. Is, an age is important, but just because we're older does not mean that we're wiser. We should be because we've, learned, we've been to the school of hard knocks. We know what it's about. But at the same time, I will tell you this here, to be mature in our faith in Christ is really the time that we've put in. Uh, I've seen people at different levels of maturity. It had nothing to do with their intellectual being. It had everything to do with a desire to get into God's Word and study it and learn it and obtain it. And, and it's an amazing thing. But I want you to realize this morning that in this message, Paul is writing to a group of people. And when you think about the epistles for a minute, the epistles are letters to the church, right? That's what we know in the New Testament because we have the Pauline letters, which is basically Paul's letters that he wrote to the churches that he helped start. And half of the New Testament consists of that. 
you know, because Paul basically wrote half of the New Testament. But in that respect, he's writing to an audience here that is important to know as he addresses them. He's addressing the Gentiles. Why? Because the church of Ephesus was a Gentile church. And so it's just like if he came here and started a church in America. It would be a church of Americans, and he may be referring, referring to Americans. Um, where if he was in China, he would refer to the Chinese because that's the audience, that's the group where the church is. And so in this case, I want you to know that the book of Ephesus is a letter that was written to a church or a, a new movement, a new group of people in the early church where he's addressing them in a space of Gentiles. Because remember, Peter was a, a leading candidate for helping lead um, the Jews to the Lord. But Paul was used to lead Gentiles. Because in this world, if you read it, it's kind of ironic. I'm not doing this deliberate, but we talk about race. The truth is the Lord looks at things as either Jew or Gentile. But then he says there's a third race. And here's the third race. There's one race of Jew, one race of Gentile. Because basically you're Gentile if you're not Jew. We are Gentiles, <clears throat> as the Bible refers. But then he says, you are no longer Gentiles once you come to know Christ as your Lord and Savior. So now he said there's a third race. He said there's what we call the new creature race. And now he, that's when he says there is, what does Paul say? No longer is there Jew or Gentile. No longer is there bond or free. He's saying now you are a new creation, a new creature in Christ. That's who we are. We are Christians. We are followers of Christ, and that's the race. That is the race that we're in, but that's the race that we're categorized in as well. And so it's remarkable. I love how the Lord works. It's not the color of our skin. It's not our culture, but it's the blood that flows from Emmanuel's veins, the Lord Jesus Christ. When we receive his blood, we are one people. Amen? Amen. All right, so let's look at this new life, and I want you to go there with me in, in uh, verse uh, 17. We're in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 17. It says, <clears throat> this I say, and by the way, I'm reading from the New King James Version this morning. I normally read from the King James. I'm just letting you know that. That way, if you look at yours, you won't think that people have left out words or something like that. But anyway, just to give you some insight. Um, it says, this I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that you should no longer... Walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk. Notice how he's referring to them. Now, that would be kind of insulting, wouldn't it? Would, wouldn't it? If somebody came into this church and said, I don't want you to walk anymore like Americans walk. We're Americans. We're proud of that. Amen? Amen. But he said, I don't want you to walk like the Americans walk anymore. Well, at first, we're going to start contemplating that because that's our roots. That's who we are. That's what we know. And, and it's like, okay, wait a minute now. My mama was American. My daddy's American. My grandfather's American. And so right now, it's kind of, wait a minute, who is this guy that proclaims to be a preacher of the gospel who's coming in here writing a letter to our congregation or our movement saying, you no longer need to walk like that? What's he referring to? So we want to dig into that. So I want you to realize that when he says, you no longer walk as Gentiles, it'd be the same thing as us being addressed as Americans. Now look on. He says <clears throat> in verse, uh, verse 17, he says, to no longer walk like the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind. Now he's, no, he's, he's marking the mind here. Look on at verse 18. Having, he says, having um, their understanding darkened. All right, what does that mean? Darkened means for the light to no longer be shined in an area. So if you see the darkening, it's saying that basically the light has been presented, and, and it's just like in here, we can darken this place. It's not that this place is already dark, but we can darken this place because the lights are shining right now. So he's saying the light has shown to them, but there is a dimming process that's happening. And something's clouding. Something's getting in their way. Now, we can leave the lights on in here, but we could get up there and start hanging black trash bags over every light in here, and we would begin to darken the place. The light is still shining. It's just like when it's cloudy outside. A remarkable thing, but the sun is not gone. The sun is on the other side of the clouds. The sun is still shining. It doesn't mean just because it's cloudy and raining and storming that the sun is not shining. 
In fact, the sun is still shining even at night. It's just not on our part of the world. It always shines. And so what he's saying here is there is a light that exists, but it can be darkened by things that cover it. You can put your hands over it. You can, the life can put, what he's saying is life will build uh, walls. Uh, life can have circumstance. And basically a circumstance is a brick and mortar. And it'll build a wall, build a wall, build a wall. Till soon enough, the light that shines on you can be blocked. The wonderful thing and the hopeful thing is, is that it still shines. No, we just got to remove the obstacle in order to get to the object. And so he's saying here that there was a darkening. He said, I do not want you to walk like them. He said, well, here's what he's saying. I want you to separate yourself from this. Now, that's tough, isn't it? Now, you know what? He did not give any specifics. This is a catch-all statement. What he is saying here is if you need to separate yourself from strangers who act like that, then separate yourself. But he's also saying that if it is your family, you need to separate yourself. Now, now what I mean is when he's saying that these people didn't know, that doesn't mean you don't love them. That doesn't mean you don't pray for them. That does not mean that you help them. That's not what he's saying. But what I am saying is this. Remember this. This is how you always know whether or not you need to leave a situation or stay in a situation. If the situation is controlling you, you need to leave. That means you're not stronger than your environment. But if you are in an environment that you can help change, then you should stay. Because God has put you there for a reason. And so I want you to realize we need to know when we're in over our head. And if it starts consuming us, I'm not being selfish here, nor does God indicate selfishness. He talks about selflessness. But he is saying that you can't help anybody if you don't have help yourself. You know, if I'm not strong enough or awake enough or got enough energy to help you move furniture, then I'm no good to you. Right? Which, by the way, I, I retired from moving furniture. It means somebody. But what I'm saying is, but when you look at this here, he's saying there needs to be a separation. Now watch this for a minute. Because I will say this to you. We blend too much. We do blend too much. And if we're blending, we're bending. If we're blending, we're bending. Now, here's what's so dangerous about that. Is God going to throw us in a bad, horrible pit because we're blending? No. But I dare to say there will be some people who won't have a chance to get out of the pit because we blended and they never could see a distinguished light. All they saw was a smorgasbord. They saw a perlo of life. They didn't know what meat was what. So therefore, they don't know. And now they're just eating and tasting this pot of perlo or this smorgasbord, and there's no distinguishment. I need to know if the light's green when I get to it. And if I'm colorblind, I'm in trouble. And maybe not you, but whoever I meet in the intersection. And God is saying that life is full of intersections. And if we are colorblind, and it's all one color, then God is saying, how will they know the light from the dark? We blend, therefore that means we bend. And God is saying, I need you to be distinguished in what you believe in. And so he's saying here, Paul has done a lot right here just in his opening remarks in this part of his letter in verse 17 and 18. But this applies to us today. Notice this. He says, <clears throat> when he goes on, he says here now, having their understanding, I'm picking back up in verse 18, having their understanding darkened, watch, being alienated from the life of God. We pretty well know what that means. Alienated just means just being completely separated. It goes on and says, <clears throat> from the life of God because of the, watch, why are they? See, I want to know why people are separated from God. That's important to me. Not just as a preacher, but as a Christian. I want to know because it might help me one day with my child's child. Or it may help me with my neighbor or my coworker. I want to know why you do what you do. How can I help my family? How can I help my friends? How can I, if I truly care about people, I can't sit here and say I love God this morning and, and, and hate people. 
then God says there's no love in me because if we love him, then we're going to share our heart with him and then he always puts our heart in, in our mind and sets it on them to be able to help people because that's what he did. And so he's saying here, why are they alienated? Verse 18 concludes by saying, from the life of God because of the ignorance. And don't be offended by that statement. The, the word ignorance in, in, in this translation is not the way we translate it today. We almost use it as a vulgar term saying, you ignorant, dummy, stupid, fool, whatever, and we just go on and go crazy. That's not it. He's saying that you're uneducated and you're unlearned. I have no problem today with somebody telling me if I have, a, have something in my hands and I'm about to perform brain surgery on you, and they say, Mac, you can't, you're ignorant. I'm like, you're right, I'm going to step away from this right now. You see what I'm saying? I have no problem if somebody went to perform brain surgery on me and they say that I'm a pipe fitter. I say, you're ignorant when it comes to working on my brain back away and so what I'm saying is we all have our works of profession our things that we are good at and so what I'm saying is you need to realize that right there I'm un I just I don't know I'm uneducated I'm unlearned I can get a question about a computer why a computer is acting up or why something is glitching and I'm like I don't know I have no idea uh, that is not a part of my world that kind of thing there and, and I just think I would die to have to sit down at one all the time anyway I mean you might well just go ahead and just suck the life out of me but I'm so glad that some of you do I love you so much because you do what I don't have to do amen and so we all work together but my point to this morning is this he's saying to us they don't know now watch I'm going to go ahead and tell you this right here ignorance is a choice You know why, after 10, 15 years of exposure to computers, I rely on other people? Because I don't want to do it. I could, be, I could be a lot further along in my knowledge of computers if I wanted to be. It has been a choice that I am still in the same position today when it comes to a computer as I was 15 years ago. Amen. It is the truth. Amen, church. It's because I have chose to neglect it, and I don't want to talk about it. And right now, I just assume you stop thinking about it. Amen, somebody. I mean, that, that's, that's that because I choose to. Now, being honest, there, I, we all have our limitations. There are certain things that we couldn't do, perhaps. But I'm saying for an overall statement, we are ignorant. Now, let me tell you another reason why people are ignorant to something. I haven't just chosen to be ignorant to computers because I don't like them, but I have chosen to be ignorant to computers because I have loved something else more. You see, it's not that I just dislike them or I don't care. It's because I have been busy with other things that I love. So I have to realize this is a twofold reason right here immediately for my ignorance when it comes to this. So don't come up here this morning and say, well, I just don't like them. No, it might be you just don't like them, but it's because you love something else more. So watch this. If these people, or if we the people, are ignorant and alienated from God, and, and, and we are having a darkening process, it's because we choose to not like it and we choose to love something more. And this is the reason. And we need to own up to that and accept that this morning and see how that can, that can so happen. We love God. Yeah. yeah we, can, we love a lot of things, y'all. Yeah, hey, listen, I love my truck, but not enough to wash it regularly. <laughs> I love my truck. I really do. But my truck takes a lot better care of me than I do it. I'll throw things in the floorboard. Well, I'm not going to go on. That's none of your business. But I'm just saying to you, I listen, I'm saying to you, I love my vehicle because it's good to me. But I'm just saying to you this morning that I'm not good to it. You see what I mean? You know, I only put gas in it when I got to. You know what I mean? It's got to get real low. You know what I mean? I even wanted to putt-putt a time or two before I do anything with it. I do what I do with it only because I got to do it. And see, what I'm saying to you this morning is we can't say this morning we love God, but then only do what we've got to do at a bare minimum. 
And it's the same way, right? We do this with God. We love God. But when things get started getting depleted in our life, whether it be our health or our wealth or, our, or, or something starts getting taken away from us, well, it's amazing how we start gravitating to God, ain't it? And so you know why? We're going to fill our tank back up only because it's on empty. What would happen if we started filling our tank up when it got about three-quarters of the way down? Or a half a tank, you see? What I'm saying to you is God is saying we're choosing this. And we need to, and, and you, know what, you know what will help us this morning and help others? If we can see this the way it is intended to be. Don't let it get misconstrued in your mind. Don't develop some type of opinion that is not literally the truth. He's saying to here to us this morning, and I didn't realize we were going to unpack that much so early, but it's so rich, so I can't apologize for that. But look at this real quick. He says here now, when you look on at verse um, verse 18, of course, he goes back, he says, having their understanding dark and being alienated from the life of God, he says, and he says, and and be um, because of the ignorance that is in them, because of what? The blindness of their heart. Look at verse 19. Who being past, who being past feeling, have given themselves over to lewdness, which is lustfulness, to work all uncleanness with greediness. He says, verse 20, but you have not so learned Christ. Church, I'm going to tell you right now, Here's what I, I let me tell you. Let me give you a passion of mine, and I and I and I know we share this passion. But you know what I would love to be able to do in the spirit of the Lord, not out of my own personal preferences, but just in the spirit of the Lord. Just through. I would love to know that I can speak to a congregation of believers and not have to convince them, but be able to speak to us, and we be in one mind in the unity of the spirit with the same desires, differences of opinions, but we all have the same object of faith. And we could get together and say, you know what we need to do, church, and when I would be able to speak to you, you would like, not because of me, because you know it's coming from the Lord. But anybody who knows me, know that God speaks through me, because if you talk to me otherwise, you're like, that must be a God thing. And, it, and it's true, I want him to get the glory, because I, I know what he's capable of in that respect. But let me say to you, I would love to be able to say, hey, church, you know what we need to do? We need to start getting together, and we need to take that verse 20, and we need to capitalize on that. And we need to learn and dig and get deep and disciple, get hungry, get your notebooks out. You know what I mean? Get your journals out, get your diaries out, get whatever you need out, and have an understanding that right now we're fixing the feast on the word of the Lord because we have an appetite for it. We're going to get rid of our apathy, and we're going to get an appetite and just dig it. But do you know what? Here's the problem. Out of nearly a 1,000 members in this church, and I forget the COVID thing or whatever, we would start out with about 300 people. And in a month's time, there would be 190 people in this congregation at most out of a 1,000-member church that is serious about learning about God. And it makes me throw up in my mouth. And, and, you know, and it's a discouraging thing when the fight's out there. It's not in here. And when I say fight, I use that as a strong term. But I'm saying, why should I have to convince blood-bought believers to want to learn more about the one who shed his blood for us? It's a very difficult thing to do. I'm going to be honest with you. Sometimes, like I tell you before, it's easier to pull a log chain than it is to push it. And I'm going to tell you, ministry many times is like pushing a log chain because trying to convince people who are on their way to heaven, who say they love God, who really, truly want to draw closer to him, it's a difficult thing, church. I'll just be honest with you. And I'll tell you before, it'll be the one thing that'll probably make me retire at 50 years old. Because I'm just telling you, I'll be like, got to that point where I'm like, you know what, I've had enough. I gave all I had for like 20-something years. I'm going to be like a Levite priest, and I'm going to retire. I mean, I just, I, I've just always said that. Because then I'm going to live the rest of my life the way I want to in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and peace, God bless you. But my thing is... Because, I've, you know, you beg and you plead and you beg and you plead and then that's just that. But anyway, nonetheless, that's another chapter of life. But we're in this chapter right now. What I'm saying to you is, I never could say, I mean, all I could ever do is just get on my, knee, my knees and beg. And I would do that if it would work, but that would only last a week or two or three. You know what I mean? Because it's not for the right reason. It has to be born of the Spirit. It has to be born of the Spirit. And you, you have to let the Spirit speak to you and move you and, and do that. So 
it, but here's what I want to show you here this morning. A new life. And he says here, I, I, here's why it is the way it is. He says, now we know. And you know what it helps us do too? It helps us understand other people better. It helps us not judge other people. It helps us not condemn them. It helps them because we can relate. And it's not that we say we make it okay, but it's like, you know what, I know what to pray for in my prayer life. It's not me just praying, I pray they'll come to church. That is such a generic prayer. But God, I pray that you will remove the things that alienate them. Lord, the things that darken their sight and blind their hearts and their eyes. And Lord, in return, that they may come to know you. Listen, just coming to church is just going to be a plus or a benefit of them coming. I want them to know Jesus Christ where they are right now. I want them to come to that knowledge and not just wait till they get to church. And so we have this new life and we realize this morning, God, you are so good that you have given us this opportunity. Your mercy is so great that in spite of me, you still give me this new life. And it's like I have this freshness and this newness in my life and that I'm able to realize today that the day can be day one of the rest of my life. And I, every day is a new day and we renew our spirit in the Lord. And then he, watch, he goes on and gets better. It says here in verse, um, go back to verse uh, 20. But he says, but ye ha you have not so learned Christ. And I'm going to go a step further. You've got to read more than what's written in red to know Jesus fully. Let me just go ahead and take you a little bit further. That's a great platform, and I encourage everybody to do it. But, but we need to go deeper than just what's written in red as well because we want to go deeper. We want to learn this relationship. And he goes here, verse 21. He says, if indeed you have heard him. Watch what he's saying, church. This is, I, I just, I've, I've heard from the Lord before, and it excites me. I, you know what I mean? I don't know if you've ever heard. I've never heard his voice audibly. I mean, some people say that. I think it's a wonderful thing. Maybe you needed to hear it audibly. I don't know. But, but like, God can speak to your heart, right? Like, he can, he can move you. He can inspire you. And then you can see where it was truly him because it wasn't your flesh. It was him. And, and he said, hey, go, go speak to that person or, or go do this for that person. And then that person come back around and, like, you know what? You didn't really realize it but had you not done that i was thinking about ending my life or i was just thinking about uh, you know doing whatever and you're like wow if god hadn't told me to have done that and had i not been willing to do that it changed that person's life because you genuinely care about people and, and and it made a difference in their life and you're like wow god was speaking to me and you like have that moment you know what i mean and and I, and I hope that that will speak to you. But anyway, look at this. He says, first, first, first 20, look at verse 21. If indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him. He said, that's so good. I, 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 I can't get over it. I just, I just love apprenticeship. I, I, and I, and I, I love to learn something new. I mean, I look for it every day. And, a lot, you know, there's a lot you can learn, you know. But he's saying here that he says, if you haven't spent time with him, he said, and you're not going to know him. He says, but, but don't you want people to be able to say, you know what? He trained him. I can tell who you were trained by. You know what I mean? I mean, you, you see, don't you see it with, with children growing up? And you see them, like, grow up in different environments and stuff where you have these people that are very harsh. You know what it was? They had one of them daddies that just hit them on top of the head and knocked them in the floor. I've seen them in the stores before. You know what I mean? And if I would have been 11, I'd done something about it. But I'm just saying, but, but they just hit him in the top of the head, and the kid goes sliding across the floor, and, and you know, they just rough on him, man. Just rough. They ain't never told them they loved them. They ain't never told them they mattered. They just rough. And then all of a sudden, one of the two things is going to happen in your life. Either you're going to turn out just like him, or you're going to do something totally opposite because you hate it. But a lot of time that thing keeps going. But you know what? But, 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 but I can see somebody hit something. You know what I, got? I think to myself? Wow, somebody must have taught him how to do that. I'm like, that's terrible right there. But what happens when you see somebody reach over there and pick that same kid up and say, hey, you okay? You say, that right there must have been trained by a totally different being. There's something different about that guy, something different about that girl, because they have been trained. I want to know, you should want to know, that when we walk on the face of this earth, that people look at us and say, you know what? That one right there has been trained by a much higher, superior being. That one right there has been trained by the Lord Jesus Christ to talk like that, to walk like that, to overcome that kind of adversity, to be able to walk through the fires of this life, to be able to just get up and be a complete gentleman and be a complete lady in the very face of Satan, to learn how to wash feet 
even when you're in the room of people who's going to betray you, the minute you walk from, walk, walk from the table, the minute you walk from this table, they're going to trade. They're going to betray you. That's some. That now that is some class act training. He's saying, when you've learned. See, what will happen is, watch this, church. I want you to see this here. What? When they see that kind of example coming out of you, watch what happens. That's light. And that light is going to, it's going to startle them, in a sense. They're going to be like, wait a minute. I don't understand. Like, why, why didn't you just cuss her out? You're going to be like, because that's, that's not the training that I have. Wait a minute. Why didn't you just slap her back? And then you start thinking in your mind, well, the one I was trained by, I mean, he was like slapped. And he didn't retaliate. He took it. What happens is I start speaking to lost people. Because I'm telling you, lost people. Listen, look at the world today. You know what the whole thing, the problem is never the problem, church. You know why the, pro, you know why the world is acting up right now? Because they don't have Jesus and they're looking for something to fill the void and they're miserable. And they're finding any little thing they can to latch on to. So, so, we should look at it this morning and say, you know what, though? If I could help shed that light on them, you know what I mean? See, it, it's, it, Christianity, Christianity is more than us just receiving the light. It's about us giving the light. And so what I'm saying is that, well, that will change lives. Let me move on this from this real quick. It says right here, look at this here now, if you will. It says, okay, he says, verse 21, he says, if, if indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, right, that you put off. Here's three things that you've got to know to do. And let's look at this here. This will help you celebrate your freedom uh, on this day and days going forward. Look at this here. Verse 22 says, he says, and that you put off concerning your former conduct, the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lust. So number one, we have to put it off, right? We have to put it off. I mean, like, this is the question a lot of people would ask. Say, who in here? It's like, yeah, who in here wants to go to hell when they die? It's like, no, no, not me. Amen? We don't want that. But it's like, who in here wants to go to heaven when they die? It's like, praise the Lord. Then we know who is the way, the truth, and the life, right? John 14, 6. And so we're like, Jesus is the way, right? And we're excited about that. And we're on our way to heaven. Well, God's saying this right here. He said, I need you to put off that life. All right? He said, okay, you're no longer that person. So that begins in two different ways at a minimum. Watch this real quick. He says, you have to take your mentality. You have to say to yourself. And you have to convince yourself, I'm not that man anymore. That, that's where it is. You don't have to go out and tell the world that. I'm going to be honest with you. You need to make sure you're convinced of that. That's where it starts. I'm not that man anymore. And then watch this here. Now watch though. I told people we're going to do things out of habit now. People could come in here and get saved in here this morning. And if they had a different, different colorful vocabulary, it is very possible that on Monday morning, some of those colors could shine out. See what I'm saying? Why? Because that's, that's, that's just been their way of life. But then people, some people will say, well, you must have didn't get saved just today because I hear your mouth. Let me tell you something for a minute. I understand what proceeds from the heart, you know, can actually come from the mouth. I understand that. But what I am telling you is we are creatures of habit. It is a lifetime process to be creatures of him versus creatures of habit. All right? So I want you to realize just because you have a slip or a failure does not indicate it. Now, that will help you in your spiritual maturity because now you're going to be at work or you're going to be at the canteen or you're going to be at the cubicle or you're going to be watching it on computer, whatever the case is these days. And when you do, you're going to hear people talk about religion because people's ever going to talk about politics or religion. I mean, these are two of the greatest things in the world. Finances, right on, right on. When people get to talking, they're going to say, you know what? That person must not have got saved. Now, let me tell you something. That person did get saved. Here's what I just want to tell people sometimes. They say, man, I, and there was an encounter one time where I knew a guy who, was, who had got saved, but he had had enough. And he slapped the guy. And the guy said, well, he must not be the Christian I thought he was. I said, yes, he is. Used to, he would have killed you. <laughs> I said, this man's maturing. <laughs> I said, you better be glad he didn't close his hand when he swung at you. He just slapped you to get your attention. Had he closed that fist, you would have woke up at him tomorrow. I mean, this, this man right here, I'm just telling you, he was good at putting them to sleep. I'm just saying. And, and I'm just saying, listen, I said, listen, this guy is saved. And you better be glad he's saved because you wouldn't be able to tell the story. This man is changing. I'm telling you, church, it takes that. 
And we don't realize it, it is a process, y'all. And so what I'm saying is when you do that, it, that doesn't mean that you take sin and you say, okay, it's okay to sin because you're just going to do that. No, 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 no. We should hate what God hates and love what God loves. But at the same time, we have to have an understanding. God's apparently understanding, isn't he? Because if we would have sinned the first time after salvation, he would have zapped us dead. He said, you didn't get it, you're dead. And what I'm saying is we need to realize that. But here's what he's saying. In our freedom, how can we celebrate our freedom? How can we rejoice? How can we be a joyful people unless we understand Christ in his word? And, and this is what I love. He, he goes on here, and when he gets to verse, uh, verse 23, he says, here's the second thing. Number one, you've got to put it off. Number two, he says, be renewed in your spirit and your mind. This is so incredible, isn't it? Now, to be renewed, you know what this means right here? You know, it's one thing to read that, and it sounds good, and it's a great little verse to put up there. But you've got to dig into this a little bit, because I'll be honest with you, this is where it starts changing. It's one thing for you to look in the mirror or, or, or go to do something and say, mm. Y'all ever put the brakes on like that before? Mm. It's like you just put a, that's like a Jake brake, doesn't it? I mean, it's just like, you know, on that 18-wheeler. And you're like, what in the world? You you can hear the, you can smell the rubber burning. And it's just like, ooh. And you start, and what starts helping you in yourself is like, they better be glad, better be glad I ain't, I ain't who I used to be. You know, because they, they some feisty people, amen? It's just like, and we're just, hmm. You ever see that a lot of time? I see a lot of my brothers and my sisters in the faith. You know, something happens, you're like, it's like in your mind, it's just playing out what just happened. You got them up like this here. You're going with the body slam, coming down with the knee, and you're like shaking that off. It's like, no. Mm -mm. You know what I mean? It's just like, mm -mm. what you're doing is you're saying, you're not him no more. You're not her no more. I represent somebody else other than Mac and Mildred anymore. Amen. I, I represent. I, I represent Jesus. I, I'm an ambassador of His, and and this person might only see the light. Cause, cause right now I pretty well know this person here ain't never gonna come to church. They they gonna have to. I'm gonna have to take the church to them. And, and you know you know this, and, and and there you are. And and he says, okay, I need you to renew your mind. Now, I begin renewing my mind. You know what renews your mind? Number one, this is the first thing that I can give you. Is Jesus real to you? When you start renewing your mind, here's what happens. You have a lot, of, and I've always told you this, but this is important. Renewing your mind is basically removing the questions in your life and the mites. Because you notice this about people. They'll think something long enough it becomes the truth, even though it isn't. Amen? Did you know that you can believe? You, did you know you can say a lie? Buy a lie and sell a lie. And you'll call it the truth. You'll say it. You'll buy it. You'll sell it. And you'll package it and label it as the truth. And all it was was a thought. It's the truth. We're very good. The truth is the greatest manufacturer of that is our mind. Right here made in the USA. And the Lord says, I need you to renew your mind. He says, right now, what I need you to do is re renew your mind. And watch this. It, it's kind of like, like this here. Um, I had that. I had that. Uh, I remember that night that I like, had that. I had anxiety, right? And like it was bad. I woke up in the middle of the night, and my heart's. And I'm like, where did this come from? You know, and it's just like, you know, just all this pressure. And I was sitting there, just, you know, this was several years ago. And I was sitting there, and things just. And I wake up, you know, and, I, and I've told somebody this before, and I was like, I, 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 I got to go, I got to go. I don't want, I don't want to die here. This is how, I, I, I was going to die. You know, it's just like anxiety, right? You think you're going to die. My heart's about to bust out my chest. And then on top of that, in my mind, I'm sitting there thinking, well, I got this athletic heart, which means I'm going to just be probably walking in here one day and fall dead. And I'll be like, yes, I got everybody's attention at one time. But anyway, but it would be, but it'd be sitting there just going, 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 going. And when it does, and it just, and I was sitting there, and it was, and, it's, and all of a sudden, mama came over. You know, and, and she started praying. And, and it was kind of like, you know, kind of like, look at me. Like, look at me. And, 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 and the thing that I relate to that is sometimes, like, when life comes, life can bring anxiety. And, and, and we can get worked up over things. And we're human. And that's normal. It'll happen. But it's almost kind of like you hear the small, still voice who starts speaking to you. And he's like, he's like, hey, look at me. Like, look at me. And he's like, look at me. 
I'm praying for you. Because when you think about Jesus and him praying for you, I mean, my mama praying for me, but, but when I know that Jesus is praying for me, ooh, and he prays for us. I mean, John 17 just wasn't a one and done. I mean, he, John 17 is powerful, y'all. And, and, and he gets there when he does his prayer. And, and it's kind of like, you know, it's like, Lord, I'm worked up. And right now, God, that person right there has ticked me off. I just assume just, just do this. And, and, and in this prayer, I'm like, Lord, you know what? Bump this right here. I'm tired, sick, and tired of wasting my time. He's like, steady now, steady. And I'm like, no, Lord. I'm like, you know what, Lord? I'm fed up with it. You can take this here and you can just do whatever you want with it because I'm sick and tired. And I'm like, you know what, Lord? I'm tired of struggling with this right here. He's like, hold on, Mac. Hold on a minute. He says, you don't know what I know. I don't care what you know anymore, Lord, because I know enough to know that I'm ready to do this here. And you just sit there and you wrestle. And you don't think this don't happen. And, you know, I'm just sitting there just be wrestling. And I'm like, you know what, Lord? Forget that. Forget that. Man, I'm 43 years old. I ain't wasted another day of my time with some sorry half-tailed people. You must be like, I ain't doing it. You can define somebody else. You can, you can make the dead come to life. Go wake Moses up. I don't care. I mean, that's just the way I feel. You know, we all get that way. But this is not just me. This is you too. You get fed up. You get to thinking about raising kids and what to do with that. It's like, Lord, I can't take it no more. Or, or it's your job or it's your people or it's your mama, your daddy, your aunt, your uncle, your grandmama, your granddaddy. Or you miss them so much you don't know how to live anymore. Or they're dead and gone and you don't have them anymore. You don't have that strength. You don't have that comfort. And like the Lord is saying, steady now, steady. This applies not just to me. It applies to you. But I can only talk about my life. I don't know what's in your head. I got enough going on in mine. And it's just like one of those things. And it's like, you know, Lord, forget that. And the Lord says, and in the midst of watch, watch me, I'm, 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 I'm running, I, I'm, I'm venting, I'm venting. And all along, all along from the word go, I couldn't hear him to begin with. But the whole time he was like, steady. It'll be all right. And all of a sudden, as I quiet down, I hear his voice. And it isn't that he just started. It's just I just started hearing him. He was speaking the whole time. And he says, look at me. Look at me in my eyes. And he says, everything's going to be all right. And when that voice comes to you and you look inside his eyes and you see what those windows reveal, it's like, okay, all right, I needed that. But here's the problem. All I needed, all I needed, all, well, watch, all I did need at that moment is for one person to get in my ear and confirm what I was thinking. All that did was dump gas on the fire. I didn't need that. But watch. When we the people seek, we seek out what you got to say and what you got to say. And when I start hearing what you got to say and you dealing with the same things I'm dealing with, now I'm fitting to go over the edge. Because guess what? I found what I wanted but I did not find what I needed and and that's what God is saying here he's saying here don't be like them don't be like them now watch you you're not better than them we're not pharisaical people you never look down on anybody you look a man or a woman in their eye we don't look down on anybody because we're no better than them we but but for the grace of God we, we've been there, we know that, and, and, and we look at somebody. Well, you know what I love about Jesus when he was on this earth? He didn't stand up. He didn't just hover over everybody. But he came as a man, and all God. And when those people didn't do right, he looked them in the eye. That's the kind of God we serve. That's the kind of church we should be if indeed we are a church that has been born and bred by Christ himself. And so look on to this very quickly, and we'll get ready to conclude. Um, there is so much here, and I encourage you so much. If, if you should, you should really go through this. You know what I mean? It would kind of give you a good measuring guide if you're even interested in learning more about Jesus. And by the way, this isn't written in red, but it's like you know what I'm saying. This is even this is deeper. Look at this. He goes on. He says, he goes, um, verse twenty, uh, verse twenty-four. Right? He says, 
th- this is actually the, the third thing. He says you've got to put it off in verse 22. You've got to renew your mind in verse 23, which means you've got to collect your thoughts and get back on it. Look at verse 24. He says, and that you put on. So put off, renew your mind, and then put on. Now, I've got to give you this real quick. He says, put on your new, let me read this here and we'll be done. And, 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 and what you've got to put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. All right, so you're telling me then, you know, you know, Tab, it's like this right here. It's like, it's like he knew who we were going to be before him. He knew that. All right, so we know that he had to send his son to die on the cross because if he knew we could do it by ourselves, then why allow Jesus to die? So that was a must. But then he's like, I know who you are before you meet Jesus. He says, but I know who you can be. And he said, I've already got a design, a divine design for your life after you meet him. He said, but it won't happen day one. He said, it's going to be a progressiveness. He says, but you're going to kind of keep moving toward that mark. And on your way up the hill, you ever think about climbing a mountain? I look at the, 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 the pinnacle of this life is to be a Christian. That, I mean, that's the, that's the pinnacle. To be, to be one of his children, to be adopted into his family, I mean, that's the most awesome thing. But, you know, if I'm climbing a mountain, I'll guarantee you along the way up that mountain, I'm going to stop a lot. And then I'm going to regroup, and I'm going to take a deep breath, and I'm going to make another ascent. And I'll guarantee you on my way up there, I'm going to get hungry, I'm going to get thirsty, on my way up there, I guarantee you, I'm probably going to get into something that's going to be, I'm going to grab something on my way up there, and it's going to put little stickies in my hand I can't see. And then I'm going to be, I'm going to sit there and on my focus on the way up that mountain, I'm like, Dad, every time I touch something, that's all I feel. I can't see it, but it bothers me. It's like a thorn in the flesh. And it's just life. And then on my way up that mountain, I guarantee you, I'm going to run into some mountain lions. And then I'm going to get up there, and I ain't got what I need because I went packing light. Right now, I wish I had Smith and Wesson, and right now, I ain't got nothing but a tree limb, and it's about to break. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's just life. And, and, and we just go, but here, here, what makes me climb the mountain? Because I know who's at the top. I know who's at the top. So every step, every day of fatigue, every moment I got thirsty, I was, I was ultimately thirsty, but I was thirsty in my pursuit, so therefore, ultimately, I was thirsty for the one. Oh, along my way, I got hungry, but I only got hungry because I was refraining from taking of this world, and I was in pursuit of God. So ultimately, I got physically hungry, but I got physically hungry ultimately because I was spiritually hungry because I had an appetite for God. I go through life fighting not because I'm angry, but I go through life because I'm after God, and I'm willing to fight for what I believe in. Because I believe in him. It ain't about me being right and somebody else being wrong. It's all about him. And I get to thinking sometimes, and watch this real close, church. There's there's a lot of great left here because you know he said he basically he walks into it as we did, starting at verse 17. Verse 22, he says, I need you to I need you to take that old person and I need you to get rid of that. Then he says, I need you to renew your mind. And what's remarkable is he said, I need you to renew your mind before you put on the new man. That's incredible how you have to look. He's very, very strategic in his order. Because he knows if you don't get your head right, your clothes ain't going to fit. And so what I'm saying is he says, now that you got it on, but watch this. And I got to thinking, I said, Lord, how can I celebrate this time of year and understand that I am a free man and I am no longer in the yoke or bondage of sin? And why should I continue to serve sin having tasted the freedom of God? And I got to thinking about the Israelites. And, I, and the Israelites, this day can be very long, but I want you to see this in short. Israelites were a people who were in bondage or slavery for 400 years. And... And, and they were there, and, and I want you to realize that even though they lived there, they, they had children. But the whole reason the bondage started from the side of Ramesses or, or, or Pharaoh was because he saw, the Israel, he saw the Israelites and he saw how they were multiplying and how it didn't take long. There was just a handful of them that grew into hundreds of thousands to where now there was over three million of them. 
And Pharaoh of Egypt, he said to himself, he says, we're going to have to take these people and we're going to have to make them slaves so that they will build for us and work for us. He said, because if our enemies came and these three million Israelites joined up with them, they could overtake us. So they made them slaves. Now watch this very closely. We are slaves to this world. We have been slaves to sin. That's how we came into this world. From the moment of conception, we were born into slavery. And when we were born into slavery, it was the same thing as the Israelites. But do you know, the people who first started the slavery, it was almost like, watch this real quick. Ready? Please, please watch this very closely as we get to, and we'll be done. And the next thing you'll be seeing is a, another little quick message at 8 o'clock tonight, and then fireworks and tailgating and all that kind of good stuff, and it's going to be great. But, but, but don't miss these fireworks. Watch this. Did you realize that from one generation to another generation, it was easier to adapt to slavery? See, what happened is, Glenn, let's say you and Debbie had been put in slavery. But your children, who would be born into that same slavery, that's all they ever knew. See, you had tasted other things in life. And you, so, you know, about that age of 20 or 30 years into the, of living one way, you had to change into slavery. So now you started being enslaved to these people, and it was called bondage. It was called the yoke of bondage, the heaviness and the weight. But your children would be born into it, and they just saw mom and dad and how everybody had it. They never saw anything else. All they knew was slavery. And they really didn't even see it as slavery because it was just a way of life. And then their children, and their children, and it's almost like every generation it got easier because now watch, it wasn't just what mom and dad did, but the next generation can look back and say, well, that's what grandma and granddaddy did and mom and daddy. And then the next generation would get over here and say, well, that's what mom and dad did and my grandma and grandpapa did, and then that's what my great-grandpa and great-grandma did. And watch, it got easier because... That's what people do today. People will farm today. People will do a business today. You know why they do it the more? It isn't because it started with them. It's because somebody has, has a legacy, and they want to live in that legacy and continue to fulfill what started long before them. And it's like their roots are deep. These people who are in Egypt, their roots got deeper and deeper and deeper. Because there was generation after generation, generation. And then what happened was there was a man who they knew, who served 40 years, who came in a time where there was one generation perhaps on the back end of their life and another generation being born. And they noticed there's this man and his man, his name is Moses. And the man can't talk good, so he's very distinguished because a lot of times, if they couldn't remember his name, they'll say, do you know that Hebrew man who is like brothers to the king? Because they grew up together. Pharaoh and Moses, they grew up together. They run together. They played on the jungle gym together. They, they, they cut one, another, one another's hand. They were blood brothers. They, Ramesses, who became Pharaoh, they was his brother. And so they grew up together because God had a plan. Moses got mad because of the way the taskmasters were treating the slaves and he killed a man and buried him in the sand and he runs to the backside of a farm and there God found him 40 years later. He spent 40 years. Remember, he spent his life was 120 years. He spent 40 years in Egypt. He spent 40 years on a farm and then he spent 40 years in the wilderness and he died. Three phases of this man's life. But every bit of it was all because God had a plan. Let me tell you, you may not live to be 120, but wonder what the first 20 years of your life was planning. What was the 20 years now? And what's the other 20 years? What's God's plan for your life? And so then he gets there, and watch this real quick. This is just fascinating to me, because I'm feeling we fit to let off the big fireworks. Watch this. He comes up there, and when he does, he goes there, and he says, Ramesses, he says, I need you to let these, let these Hebrews go. I need you to let my people go, the Israelites. He says, God spoke to me and it's time for them to be delivered because he told me that he has heard their cry and he, said he knows their sorrow and he wants to turn them loose. He says, will you turn them loose? He says, no. Ten rounds of it, plague after plague after plague after plague. 
he finally turns them loose. Those millions of people who were enrooted in there, when they get to the wilderness, and you watch this close, because this is all, watch, everything you know about these Israelites is the very picture you see in Ephesians 4 of taking the old man off, renewing your mind, and putting the new man on, and living your life as a free man and woman. So it's, it's just a long, gradual, unfolding picture. It's the same thing. And if Ephesians 4 is the cliff notes of what happened in Israel when it talks about Egypt and these people. It's just amazing. It's amazing. Watch. They get out there, and when they do, they get out into the wilderness. God just did ten plagues, and the people saw it. They were moved. They get over there. When they do, they get to the, they get to the Red Sea. And there ain't nowhere to go and the water parts and they walk across on dry ground and they watch God collapse the water on all the Egyptians. Right time they get on the other side, good, God says, I'll lead you. And he gives them a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. He says, just follow that. When that moves, you move. When it stops, you stop. Look at these phenoms that are happening. This is God. And this is God unfolding and, and leading people and showing them the way. And, and, and God's doing these miraculous things. And, 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 they, and, they, and they get there to tomorrow, and, and, and there's this bitterness of, of water. And, and then they throw the tree in there, and, it, and it's talking about the cross, and just all these phenomenal things, step by step by step. Their shoes are going, they're not wearing out. They say they get hungry. God bakes fresh bread from heaven and lays it on the morning dew so the dirt don't get in it. And in the evening, he feeds them quail. Every day. And gave them twice as much on Friday for Saturday. And that was the only day it wouldn't spoil. Look at God. This is what the people did with that. And I'm going to show you why. They were a people who were enrooted in slavery. As we have been enrooted to the slavery of sin. And what happens is we always go back to what we know the best and I'm going to say to you today if you've been living this life of faith of any length of time and you're willing and ready to go back to where you come from that tells me that we, you and I have not put enough time in knowing Jesus Christ as Paul talked about in Ephesians chapter 4 he said you ain't learned from him because you want to go back to what you know so that means you are more familiar with what you used to do than what you've been doing And God says you need to change that. Because if you're contemplating going back, if you're contemplating going back to doing this and doing that, and you know, well, I'm about ready to go back and go hang out with my buddies and do this and do that, and blah, 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 blah. What did you show them? You showed them that the life you shared with them on Friday nights and Saturday nights was more important than the life you tried to invite them to on Sundays, if you please. And you said, I went and tasted the light, and it ain't no better. And you went back to it. What did you just tell them? That what Jesus got don't compare to what the world offers. And you'd rather go celebrate in that than to celebrate in Jesus. You know what that tells me? You are a fool. And God says, apparently you have not learned from me. So watch what happened. The Israelites got out there and they watched. Right time the food came, this is what they said. I want to go back to slavery. Listen to what they're saying. Who could have ever tasted the Lord and said, I'm ready to go back to slavery? Watch. And you know what I get to thinking? Watch. It started with food. I said, food? Yeah. You know why? It wasn't that. Because remember, the problem is never the problem. It wasn't that they could have beef and they wanted pottage and blah, blah, blah. And they start talking about this stew that they would eat there in Egypt. But these people, watch, they would rather, rather had go back and live in slavery with no say-so. They'd rather live there and, and be, live in the certainty of slavery than to go and walk and follow God in the certainty. Not trusting God would take care of them and supply their every need. See, there's something that's built into us. And when we don't know, we go stupid. 
It's like we can't trust God. We can't just say God, God's, a lot of people can't say, well, why are you here? Say, I don't know. And you say, what do you mean? All I know is God told me to be here. He'll tell me when he's ready. And, and, and it's amazing to me. And, and watch. And the other thing was that even through those lessons, these people had a desire for something to worship. So when Moses is up on the mountain and he's there getting the, the first set of the Ten Commandments, they start melt, melting gold together. Because these people had a desire to worship something. They would rather worship an immediate golden idol than to wait on a sovereign, mighty God. Food. Impatience. They couldn't wait 40 days. They said, this is what they would say in the old King James Version. This one, we would to God. We were back in Egypt. You know what they were saying? We'd rather be there. Do you know what happened to those people? You know how it turns out for them? They tasted the Lord for 40 years and died short of the promise land. All because of what? Ready? Watch this. And this is the key to your life. And you hear me good this morning. God took those people out of Egypt. But he never could get Egypt out of them. He could take them out of slavery. But he could not take the, the slavery out of them. It became a part of them. It embedded in them. And it was a DNA. But I'm here to tell you this morning to testify and to witness to you. That God can break all chains. He can set you free from the heaviest yoke of bondage. I don't care if you've been doing it for 40 years or 400 years. God can break it. And God can set the captive free. But watch, those people, they put off. They never put on. They never put on. And so watch, they got freed so they could flee. To do what they want God has not set me and you free to go flee to do what we want to do but he has set us free so that we will follow him willingly and so today we should celebrate and rejoice in the fact that we are free men and women who have free will amen to serve him and to live for him but I'm telling you this morning, you never need to stop doing what God's called us to do. You have not arrived until you see him face to face. Until then, we're on a journey, and we're going to keep pressing on, and we're going to learn from other people, and we are going to grow together and not apart, and we're going to remind one another we might be taking off the old man. And why, you know what's so good about this? The maturity from this. You can talk to people who right now are saying, you know what, I'm struggling. And you know what you can do? You can go to Ephesians 4 right now and say, listen, this must be for you. And you can go there and say, I see where the old man's come off of you because you ain't who you used to be. But I can also see you stalling and getting to where you need to be. So that tells me you're still working on the process of you took it off, but you ain't putting nothing back on you. And you say, well, I'm ready to put it on. And I say, have you renewed your mind? Well, what do you mean renewed my mind? You need to change the way you think. And you need to start thinking like Christ thinks. How do you do that? Learn from him. How does he forgive? How does he love? How does he show mercy? How, how, does, he, how does he treat the government? How does he, does he pay his tithes? Does he, does he pay his taxes? And let the things that are important to God be important to you. And the things that are not important to God, let it be a fleeting thought. But I'm here to tell you today, we are the children of God. Amen, church? Let's stand together this morning and give him praise. Amen? Because if it were not for him, we would not be where we are today. Amen, somebody?